This year, Leica Microsystem celebrates 10 years of Leica Super Resolution innovation. About 20 years ago, you invented Super Resolution. You challenged a physical law that was regarded as irrevocable for 120 years. Actually, what I challenge is the perception. People believed that it was not possible to uh, overcome the diffraction barrier in a light-focusing microscope. But what it, I could show in the end that there is physics, there are physical phenomena that eventually allow you to see at much greater detail, so down to the nanoscale. So that was the actual discovery. Um, yeah, I think this is something that uh, is turning out to be important. And how did that happen? Well, to tell you the truth, I, I did my PhD thesis um, in a startup company called Heidelberg Instruments, um, which uh, Leica was actually heavily involved in. And I was asked to um, analyze uh, the imaging capability of confocal microscopy. But I felt that the actual topic of my thesis wasn't that interesting, and I felt that the only remaining interesting problem of light microscopy was the diffraction barrier. And this is how uh, I started to think about whether it's really no way to beat that or to come up with an interesting idea that would, that would uh, in the end uh, 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 lead to a, say, nanoscale resolving uh, light microscopy instrument. And uh, that was the actual beginning. And so I was fascinated by this idea of finding a physical way to overcome the diffraction barrier. And finally, I was convinced that there must be one. And people have not looked carefully at it. But I realized that it won't be by changing the waves. It has to be something to do with. Uh, with the material that one is looking at. It has to be something to do with the flow of force. And so I started screening for physical phenomena in flow of force that would allow one to, to overcome the diffraction barrier and that turned out to be the right path. Super resolution has revolutionized light microscopy. Did you have moments in which you doubted the success? And did you recognize the big impact of super resolution at that time already? Well. Um, I must say I, I was kind of convinced that there is a way because I felt that within 100 years after the diffraction barrier has been coined, there must have been some physics emerged uh, that would be useful for overcoming the diffraction barrier. So I was quite convinced. Otherwise, I would not have bet my career <laughs> or my, my professional life on, uh, on this topic. Um, of course, there were always doubts or question whether um, it would work the way I had planned, it would work that well. So this wasn't clear at all. And of course, many experiments had to be done. Uh, many details had to be sorted out in order to, to, to get it, uh, get it uh, work uh, properly. There is no doubt about that. And uh, that is, there's a lot of work behind that. There's no doubt about that. And did you rec recognize the impact that super resolution would have in our days? Honestly, I did it out of curiosity. I didn't do it because I wanted to have a big impact initially. So I also didn't think much about the impact it could have in the life sciences, or they would have in the life sciences. But of course, I knew that if one is capable of demonstrating that there are physical ways of overcoming the diffraction barrier, it definitely will have an impact. But this was not my, this was not my initial motivation. It was curiosity to see if one can challenge a physical perception, put it that way. And of course, once it works, then you know this is going to be important. Can you describe the moment when you saw the first super resolution image after the theor theoretical paperwork and how did you feel? Well, I must say this was, um, of course, fascinating. It was very pleasing, no doubt. But it also gave me a lot of satisfaction because um, uh, as I indicated, I, I spent many years of my life initially how to find a way and to get beyond the diffraction barrier. And when the first experiments worked, say, for pi microscopy, which didn't break the diffraction barrier, but, but was a significant step in the development, or that when I realized that this would work, um, it, um, it was, of course, very, 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 very pleasing. It's not like that that I was keen of publishing it instantly, but it gave me a kind of um, say satisfaction and now I'm sure it's going to work and this is going to come no matter what will happen because it's viable. So it gave me this feeling, oh, okay, I've seen something that, um, that is really important. It is viable to overcome the diffraction barrier. It's viable to make images at a nanoscale. You have conducted countless super resolution experiments. Which one was the most fascinating or the most challenging? Well, I, 
if you do a certain experiment or, or planning and, and, and so on and carrying it out, in the end all of them are challenging as long as you don't know if, if they work. Uh, I think the full pie was an important step initially. Uh, people doubted that you could handle it, that the effect would be, say, reliably there. And today you have four pi or four pi like systems in all kind of super resolution systems. So it was a really important step. When I saw for the first time that this would work out, you can add the aperture, you get this interference phenomena very stably and, and you get this uh, strong increase in actual resolution. This was very pleasing. But of course, when I realized that you can turn the die on and off by stimulated emission and play on and off the separate features and this would be a reliable and a robust physical effect. Um, that I, I was, was, of course, um, uh, very, very happy and it was, was really yeah, uh, very pleasing to see. And not only that, it was clear that not just stimulated emission would work, but also other phenomena that are kind of related and get to the same point. So playing other types of, of state transitions, on-offs. And so I knew that this is going to be a field and this is going to, to, to be important. The first commercial, commercial super resolution system was the Leica TCS 4 Pi launched in 2004 and the first step microscope followed in 2007. So for more than 10 years you have been working closely together with Leica Microsystems. How did this collaboration develop? Actually, um, it started out by a coincidence. As I said, I did my PhD season at a little company, startup company called Heidelberg Instruments, which was partially uh, purchased uh, by, um, by Leica. And this is how I, I knew all the people uh, who were involved in development. Some the key people, especially in the initial days at Leica, were my friends from my PhD student days. And so I had a personal relationship um, with the people who were responsible for the development. This certainly uh, facilitated a lot. So there was a relationship of, of trust and understanding. They knew that I was very serious about the resolution and developing this field. And of course, I knew that uh, the people at Leica are professionals in terms of in terms of how to get things done, and they, they could really um, say appreciate what I was doing. Have there been special moments during that collaboration um, that were particularly memorable? I think what um, let's say was a very pleasing moment and made a lasting impression on me when I realized that um, the R and D de development had in those days made a conscious decision um, about um, uh, developing super resolution in this company. They had realized, or a large fraction of them had realized, that in the end, resolution is the most important property of the microscope. And if, if that is not cutting edge, then the rest of it is less, less important. Um, yes, I think um, um, Leica was the first company to recognize that. Where do you see future opportunities to develop super resolution techniques? Well, I see many opportunities. I mean, in the end, um, the major difference or the fundamental difference between, uh, say, the diffraction limited old systems and uh, current so called super resolution systems is that uh, the diffraction limited system, they try to separate adjacent features by the phenomenon of focusing. You try to focus light sharply. And then, of course, it's separated by directing light here, and then there, and then there. And of course, this is limited by diffraction. But the fundamental difference of the current super-resolution microscopes over, say, the diffraction-limited one, ones, is that you do the separation by a state transition, say, in the flow form. You turn it to a dark state, turn it to a bright state, or vice versa, or to another state. You need a state transition. And because of that, the molecules that we look at are essential, and the features of the molecules, the spectroscopic features of the molecule are, are essential. And therefore, the development of super resolution microscopy is, by definition, and most naturally, very much a development of, say, uh, the molecules that we look at, say, of the fluorescent probes or, or any kind of probes that we look at, because in the end, the resolution s comes from how we treat the probes, how we prepare the probes in the in the different, or the flow of force in the different states. And there's a lot of um, uh, uh, potential for development, also a need for development, no doubt. 
Stimulated emission depletion theoretically enables unlimited optical resolution. What is the maximum achievable resolution in practice? I think it's very important to separate the two, um, uh, you know, the conceptual limit and the practical limit. And the reason why I'm saying this is the following. Um, conceptual limits hardly change or per perhaps never change. But practical limits always change because technology progresses. You can think back NMR or any other, say, important development um, that took place in the, in the biophysical field or in other fields. Um, um, it gets better as technology progresses. So the conceptual limit of stent microscopy and other subdiffraction um, imaging, um, say, methods is the size of the molecule in the end, the molecular scale. Right now, um, the standard resolution that you should get with a decently set up stand microscope is something like 25 nanometers, 20 nanometers. And, but that just depends on the probes. And so if you have better probes, you get better. And I'm very convinced that um, in the coming years, there will be significant progresses made in the field of, of, of uh, labeling, fluorophore making, or whatever, um, that allows higher spatial resolution or quicker imaging and so on. So which new areas of application for super resolution do you see in the future? Of course the life sciences, that's most naturally because fluorescent microscopy is the most popular see, microscopy technique in, in the life sciences. All areas of, of the life sciences more or less, be it um, cell biology, environmental biology, you name it. Um, there is also significant uh, potential for application in the material sciences if you can deal with, um, with a, a reporter that can be toggled between two states, more or less. In many cases it has to be fluorescence, but not necessarily. And um, um, so I see also a significant amount of application there. There is a lot of application, I think, also in the um, tracking or, say, following the diffusion of molecules in, um, in, um, in cells um, that could be on an individual molecule level, but not necessarily so. It could also be like in a collective mode, like a kind of correlation spectroscopy mode. So there is a lot of potential. And as a scientist, you have achieved a lot and you have received many awards. The road leading to this point was sometimes very hard. What is driving you and how have these successes changed your life? Well, I always felt that um, the most rewarding thing about science is to have fun. And um, if you think about something and then you investigate things and it turns out, in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases it turns out that it works the way you want, then this is, this is very pleasing, it's very, very satisfactory, it gives you a lot of freedom to to, uh, to do new things, and so I, I felt, um, despite the hardship, that it was definitely was hardship. Despite the hardship, I felt this very rewarding. So, in the end, I would say the reward overcompensated the hardship. But initially, there was hardship because hardly anyone believed that this would work. And you can, if you look back, you can, you can see that for many, many years there was no one working in the field. And after a couple of years, um, somebody else, and the late Mats Gustafsson, for example, and then. Uh, this tells you that there was a disbelief, and this was definitely hard to, to f fight against the circumstances, and the funding agencies, and, and all these things, colleagues, to convince them that there is, there is an option um, to, to do it. And this also answers your question. So I personally think that now that it's clear that, uh, that this is all viable and there is success, and I definitely have been yeah, su successful enough, for me, it's also important now to foster young scientists, to scout for young people who um, may have interesting ideas that may not be recognized, um, but are on the right track. And for me, it's also very pleasing um, to help them whenever it's possible. So this is one of the, say, hobbies that I have in my job, is um, uh, to look out for, for, for interesting, say, um, young scientists, um, who um, come up with new ideas that are maybe totally unrelated with, with super resolution microscopy, but may be important, may have impact. What advice would you give young researchers for their careers? Well, um, I think um, 
I think planning a career, in, in my personal view, is, is the wrong thing. So I, actually, I didn't plan my career. So I, I stayed in science after my PhD thesis, doing my PhD, um, because I had fun of checking out whether the diffraction barrier can be overcome. So making plans maybe not the right attitude. Um, but if I, I sh need to give an advice about plans, or so I would say um, one should stay in science if one feels that, that one likes science and that can enjoy staying in science with all the pluses and minuses. If that is um, the decisive, say, attitude, if, if, if one feels that this science is yeah, gives the pleasure and, and, and also can have the passion for the science, then, then one should, should stay in science. And then, in my view, it's advisable to work on problems that are, say, that others didn't think about. I think originality can also be seen by selecting a problem. So you, it's better to select a problem than not any, an, anyone works on. And then it's potentially possible to, to make important discoveries or make breakthroughs not work in somebody else's field or enter a field. There may be breakthroughs also in fields that are kind of existing, no doubt, but, but I would personally advise people to, to scout for interesting problems that people may have overlooked. Great. Thanks a lot.